This podcast was generated by AI. This was it was a voice, a language model, and a voice model, and a deep fake model. How do you even know that any of this is real? Are we ready to go? Yeah. Right, let's go. So, uh, you may or may not have seen, but there has been an open letter written by Elon Musk Mm. and Steve Wozniak, amongst many others. And we've called an emergency meeting. And we've called an emergency podcast to discuss said letter. Mm. Um, So, I'm going to read it out verbatim. So, take a seat. Uh, Right. So, pause giant AI experiments and open letter. We call on all AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. AI systems of human competitive intelligence can pose profound risks to society and humanity, as shown by extensive research and acknowledged by top AI labs. As stated in the widely endorsed, oh God, Al-Silamar AI principles, Advanced AI could represent a profound change in the history of life on Earth and should be planned for and managed with commensurate care and resources. Unfortunately, this level of planning and management is not happening, even though recent months have seen AI labs locked in an out-of-control race to develop and deploy ever more powerful digital minds that no one, not even their creators, can understand, predict, or reliably control. (laughs) Uh Uh-oh. Contemporary AI systems are now becoming human competitive at general tasks, and we must ask ourselves, should we let machines flood our information channels with propaganda and untruth? Should we automate away all the jobs, including the fulfilling ones? Should we develop non-human minds that might eventually outnumber, outsmart, obsolete, and replace us? Should we risk loss of control of our civilization? Such decisions must not be delegated to unelected tech leaders. Powerful AI systems should be developed only once we are confident that their efforts will be positive and their risks will be manageable. This confidence must be well justified and increased with the magnitude of a system's potential effects. OpenAI's recent statement regarding artificial general intelligence states that, in quotations, at some point it may be important to get independent review before starting to train future systems and for the most advanced efforts to agree to limit the rate of growth of compute used for creating new models. We agree, and that point is now. Therefore, we call on AI labs to immediately pause for at least six months the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. This pause should be public and verifiable and include all key actors. If such a pause cannot be enacted quickly, governments should step in and institute a moratorium what's a moratorium what's a moratorium oh good question um something to do with you don't know do you well it's like a mortgage i don't know i know i've got health insurance that's like a moratorium insurance i'm impressed you know that a temporary prohibition of an activity yeah there Mm. you go i knew that yeah quite dramatic very dramatic Mm. i would say yeah do you think it's a little bit too based in, in as much as they they might have interest in certain things that want to catch up? Ah, so th- there's one point. Skeptical. Um, yeah, well, that's an age thing, isn't it? <laughs> the the other thing I think is what worries me slightly more is our world leaders haven't come to this conclusion. It, some of our tech giant leaders have gone. Hang on, let's press the pause button because ultimately, how how we they I think right at the end you said there, Steve needs to be verifiable. Mm. Well, who's going to verify it if it isn't an, a you know a, a government, a nation, a, a you know? Um, I was going to say UEFA. Then I didn't mean that <laughs> uh, EU. You know let's what I mean? Set Blatter involved. Yeah, he'll sort yeah. it out. Um, yeah, wouldn't he for a few quid? He want a few quid. <laughs> That's my, my my worry. My worry is around the fact. I think it's. I think what they're saying is spot on. I think it's the evolution of it and the speed that mm. it, that it's evolved. But I'm chucking loads of things out here. 
is it not already too late? Well, they've not taken over yet, have they? It's not. It's not quite iRobot. No, agreed. It's not quite Skynet, is it? No. Um, that we know of. Well, that's the within thing. some of these labs, that's there, the there thing. might be because obviously your boy Elon mm. has been sort of you know raising the alarm mm. for a while. For a while, in regards to AI. Was that part of the Elon theatrical sort of, you know, the persona? Mm. Maybe to an extent, but, um, you know, he's been saying it for a while. Is there outside interest? Like, are they trying to curb the development so they can catch up? That's always a possibility. It seems to me that in, in, in the last couple of weeks, and this isn't chat GPT, it's possibly DALI 2 or Mid Journey or something like that. Um, but you guys might have seen these AI generated images of like Donald Trump, Trump. being arrested. Yeah, yeah. Um, then there was one recently of Elon Musk being in a relationship with, I forget the woman's name, but some important woman. And you see on Twitter that there'll be like a little disclaimer. Um, you know, the users have, have, have pointed out that this is actually an AI generated image, but they look hmm. exactly real. Yeah. The only thing that gives them away, if you're ever in doubt, look to the hands. Because the AI really struggles with fingers and it's mm. always giving people too many fingers or multiple thumbs. And if people are holding hands... They might be from Lincolnshire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no idea. You just need to qualify that by saying that's where you're from. I, I am, I'm also <laughs> um, from Lincolnshire. Just can I just admit, which I'm slightly... Well, I'm going to go for it. I thought the Donald Trump one was true. Mm. There you go, you see. I, only because it, it, I saw it on whatever social medium I was looking at. Mm. And thought, well, no surprise there. Keep yeah. keep flicking. That that's a bit of a revelation for me. Yes, yeah, and he's been talking about it as well. So it, it, you know, they've they've created these images that play into something that has the potential to happen, and that's probably where the risk is. And then it's not f- quite related to this. But then if you if you sort of broaden the net to, you know, deep fake technology and these new apps now that can like mimic someone's voice. Um, and then combine all of these things together, chat GPT, DALI 2, mid journey, deep fakes, voice fakes, all that stuff. And the, the high volume of content and the pace of it all that's going on social media, it, it will get to a point where even by the time you do verify these things, mm. you know, what's that old saying? Like the, a lie can get around the world yeah. before the truth has even had a chance to put its trousers on. Mm. And so... <laughs> It is risky, but what what do you think, Steve? Being I, the AI, I, I, think, I, I think it's a bit of a fool's errand, really, to to try and stop this. Yeah, it's just yeah, I just it's on what from what point of view? It's a bit like when the Luddites were going on about you know machines taking over their jobs on the manufacturing lines or whatever. They, I want to make sure my history is right, but I'm sure they did that sort of thing. And it's just for me, it's just the modern version of that it's just it's not going to happen it's technical evolution will always happen and will always continue and we need to adapt and learn how to live with it but so on that yeah you're i I get i get that uh and to a degree i I, i'm with you i I suppose from the luddites to you know manufacturing advances that technology and machines can make things more efficient and, and whatever We've we've evolved obviously to a point where now a machine taking over isn't dangerous, it's just more efficient. Mm-hmm. AI taking over to a point where it could then not be stopped potentially, surely that's different because that's not efficient, that's dangerous. Mm. Yeah, well, it, this is this is new to us, but you know, well, 100, not- 150 years ago when the tractor came out, everyone was like, a metal horse? I can't use a metal horse. You know, like what if somebody stands in the way of the metal horse or it's just, it's just, it's just the new thing. And it's going to take some time for us to adapt and, yeah, and work out how we need to put some guardrails in place. I don't know what the guardrails are, mm. but we need to put some crash helmets. Behind some, it. Oh yeah. Some guardrails in place to make sure that we can, we minimize the risk, but you can't stop technological oh, advances. I agree with you. Um, but, are you, I feel like you're being a bit flippant about it, if I'm honest. It, to me, this seems like this could be like an Oppenheimer sort of moment. And so like, you know, even with um, the the atom bomb mm. um, and just nuclear bombs in general, you know, only, well, a bunch have been tested, but only two have ever been used, right? Mm. 
Mm. And then after that, it was like, right, we don't mess around with these, you know, and everyone's got them and everyone's worried and terrified, even currently with everything that's going on with Russia and Ukraine and, and so on and so forth. And I just feel like, you know, is this potentially we're going down the same route where it's so innocuous? I mean, phones, social media, right? right? It becomes like so ingrained in in society before you even realize all of the negative downsides to the thing that you're actually using. Mm. And I think with the AI thing, and and now it's like, there's just so much new stuff coming out all the time. Mm. Like in our lifetimes, you know, we remember... <laughs> I think that was an unnecessary laugh. No, I was gonna. Uh, it, it wasn't <laughs> evil. I was gonna. I was gonna be edgy. But hi guys, just jumping in. I want to talk about one of the services we offer, which is robotic process automation, also known as RPA. That is software that replicates human behavior. So if you've got people downloading spreadsheets, attaching them to emails, going on portals, downloading information, moving data around. All that stuff is perfect for a robot. So if that's interesting, get in touch. Let's have a chat. Let's see if we can help. Enough from me. Back to the conversation. We all remember a time when there was no internet, when there was mm. no mobile phones, when there was no YouTube, there was no Twitter, there was no social media, there was no AI. Mm. There was none of this stuff. You know, probably we can remember there was no laptops, no computers. There was only four channels on TV. Remember when the fifth channel came out? I do remember it well, yeah. It was yeah. a revelation, it right? Was. To be fair, when the fourth came out, it was a revelation. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, but I mean... I, I, do, I do agree that we need to work out what the guardrails are, and we haven't got any at the minute. So laws... So if people are using AI-generated imagery for kind of manipulative purposes or whatever, then, yeah, we should be, we should be putting some laws around that and... Um, you know, charging people that, that use it. I, I, yeah, you're right. So when you were reading the the open letter out, I, uh, the thing that was screaming in in my head was a bit like what you just said. There, there need to be there need to be some protocols in place. Mm-hmm. But then while you were continuing to read, I was thinking, but the intelligence of these AI things it could take it even past that where they'll be able to manipulate around whatever the protocols, and so that's the danger. Of, don't get me wrong, and hopefully I haven't been portraying this, you know, so far, is the power of AI in its current guise mm. is unbelievable and it's unbelievably helpful. Um, and in certain areas and mediums, it's not very helpful in, you know, f- fake news and all that sort of stuff. But for me, I, I think the continual development, as you rightly say, is inevitable, but these you know, guardrails, as, you, as you're calling them, you know, I, the, the first issue is who's going to police it. And then the second issue is <clears throat> how tight and how rigid can you make them to A, still allow creative development, mm-hmm. but within the realms that, you know, future generations in, well, in, let's say in two future generations, they're not obliterated by AI bots and, and whatnot. Yeah, so the, I think the government has some catching up to do. Probably every government has catching up to do. The public sector and the likes of Google have, have so far ahead of the government's knowledge that how, how do they police it. But they need to try and bring that knowledge. Is it quangos? Is quangos that what they're called? And yeah, yeah, getting people from industry into the kind of committees to start to understand, well, how does how does the development of technology impact upon our rules But in, in terms of the laws of the country? But... Yeah, the laws of the country should still be relatively the same in terms of you know fraud. It's just, it's just another tool in the toolkit that people can enact fraud. Mm. But then we need to be understanding how we can use the power of AI to actually identify where that is taking place. So you're right, and so okay. these are the these are the sort of early issues that we're seeing, right? So mm. I'm thinking, right, like, why don't we just like go forward a little bit and imagine where it can go. So when I was doing some of my research, I discovered um, this ex- this sort of experiment that they've done with AI. And basically, um, it's it's not the case that necessarily, like you said, oh, will the AI be deceptive or whatever? Now, it's not, be, it's not that it would be deceptive in the same way that a human would be deceptive, right? But that the algorithm through, you know, calculating the most efficient way to do X, Y, or Z would cause it to do something that we would perceive as being deceptive. So, for example, there was an experiment done where a robot would uh, or an AI would get positive feedback if it would if it could pick up a bottle with like a claw. 
Um, and the, obviously the positive feedback of, of, I guess, saying, yeah, you did that well or no, try better, um, means that the, the, the surface goal is pick up the ball, but actually mm. some sort of sub goal, possibly the actual goal is get good feedback. So it sort of learned that it didn't actually need to pick up the ball. It just had to position the claw in such a way in front of the camera to make it appear that it had picked up the ball. And then it got loads of unearned feedback and they then realized further on the line, like, oh, it's it's learned that actually the most efficient thing to do is to not even do the, the thing that we're asking it to do, mm. but just to get the positive feedback, which is ultimately it's it's, it's full goal. And then the, the the guy went on to say, um, he said something like, you know, it's like saying, I can't, you can't fetch coffee when you're dead. So if you're an AI or a robot that's been trained to bring me coffee whenever I need it, mm -hmm. you might at some point calculate that, well, if I don't exist, I could not fulfill my goal, which is to bring the coffee to the person when they need it. Therefore, other things then become possibilities, you know, preventing myself from being destroyed and then it does become this whole ai thing where it's like protect man then becomes protect humanity which means protecting some of humanity from other members of humanity so i think that and and it's it's like i mean i'm not a developer i'm not in this world right, right? but you know i know a, a thing or two i watch plenty of youtube videos listen to podcasts and what have you and it's like the complexity of the whole thing. It's like in, in gaming, what I found out in gaming is when you create like one of these amazing new PS5 games, right? Mm. All of the code, you, it becomes so interwoven and tangled up that if you wanted to say delete a whole chapter or remove a whole city, you can't just go in there and just delete it because you don't know what the consequence it'll be to the whole thing that you've built. And it could just mess up the whole game. So what, you, what they have to do is they do... Uh, they, they do link breaking so it's just sever the ability for the player to get from a to b mm. and i imagine there's a similar thing at play when you code some of these um language models are they yeah that's language um when you set that all mm. all up it's not like you know exactly what everything's doing and why it just it gets the results and you either cut stuff off or you don't cut stuff off and so re within the game are uh, all of the coders mistakes all of the things they're most embarrassed about mm. missions that they change their mind on that you'll never get to play and i would imagine within these ai there are also these like hidden things and if by some somehow mm. they manage to reconnect those links or whatever who knows and i think that's the thing it's like we're playing or you know humanity is playing with stuff that like we don't even understand how the human mind works and yet we're trying to create simulated versions of minds mm. um i just think all new a lot of new technologies uh have many positive things and there's but there's there's often negative byproducts of new technologies if you look at look, cars like humanity has advanced significantly as a result of the car but how many people have died as a result of cars a lot like thousands tens of thousands probably, yeah, millions. probably millions yeah and we but we've learned to adapt to that technology over the years and it's going to be the same with this yeah but some people dying versus potential human extinction but you you're talking about going from zero deaths as a result of a robot mm. the ai within a robot becoming this kind of murderous creature mm. to suddenly wiping out humanity we're not i don't think we're going to get there will there be some some pain along the way will there be some stuff we didn't expect it that results in some deaths potentially mm. but that's our job as humanity to to be agile enough to kind of handle that imagine. <clears throat> but aren't <clears throat> aren't we the, ultimately at the moment and i'm sure it was either you or someone else that was telling me about this this book and at the moment ai bots and whatnot aren't quite as intelligent as humans or the most intelligent humans if if you will but in the not too distant future, they will be more. So when you say that's up to humanity to police that and things like that, ultimately in the not too distant future, there'll be AI bots that will be more intelligent than us that will find a way to sidetrack that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not arguing. I, I like the idea of AI and I can see so many benefits to 
how it's going to add a lot of value to us, you know. Uh, so just take what we do, being able to chuck, you know, code or whatever into a chat GPT-4 bot to go spot, you know, can't spot the error. Well, there's your error. Brilliant. Mm-hmm. That's just saved us two days, like fiddling around trying to find it as an example. Mm-hmm. Um and then do that on a much grander scale. The time and whatever is is going to be off the charts, uh, you know, savings and whatnot. But for me, and it's an unknown, isn't it? You know, we've instantly kind of gone down the what if it gets way more intelligent than man, and then it starts to rule the roost, and then we're we're visitors on Earth rather than being, you know, we are visitors on Earth anyway. But you get the, mm. the gist. That that's my. Yes, I, I see all the benefits and I see some negatives. Unfortunately, in my head at the moment, the negatives are quite big because of the unknown and the lack of visibility as to how it can be controlled. Yeah, so we, we definitely need to harness the power of AI to, to help manage and control AI. And I don't think that's what we're not doing that at the minute. We're letting private enterprise run off with AI, which is which is great. But actually, you know, governments, the law needs to think about how do we start to use that power to start to manage it as well. Because if you're right, if, if we don't, we're at risk of kind of losing control of it. And, and that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because I listen to you and I'm nodding and I agree and I wholeheartedly agree. But then it's kind of like we're restricting the, this immense power for the right reasons. and And it's kind of like counteracting the whole point of it if you like because we is uh, and then i'm gonna um bracket that by saying you've only got to look at you know we've you've been, used cars as an example mm-hmm. you know we limit cars that have got capability of doing you know bloody mac 3 probably mm. and we go can't go past 155 which is still <laughs> more than double the speed limit mm. of the, in the country so actually maybe what you're saying is is bob on and it is necessary um but Potentially, the power of AI versus the power of a automobile is the the potential is seismic. So, yeah, because the I mean, maybe there was, but like people are writing open letters or didn't write open letters saying, "I think we need to knock off this whole car situation." And there's you know there's some quite well respected individuals that have signed mm-hmm. this like you know this this letter. Um, you know, and let's assume it's not because there's some sort of, you know, they've got some ulterior motives to try and disrupt the market or whatever. Mm. Like, yeah, and I, I don't think there is. I, I, but what I, if there was? How good would that be? Yeah, I just, I think Elon and, and Steve Mortadiak have got enough money that they don't need to, yeah. and they're so successful, they don't need to think about how can I try and pull I, the rug from under my competition so, so in that sense. Agree. I don't mean it's like it's that. It's their nervousness not... It's not about way. money. Well, no, I think... It, it's it's a real it's a valid concern, and mm. the fact that those individuals are are flagging this risk it does make you think. Actually, yeah, that there's something in this, mm. but that just makes me think we need to work harder to put the guardrails in place to manage it and control it, as opposed to stopping it. Yeah, that just seems like a fool's errand. No, and I mean they're not saying necessarily stop it, are they? And they're not saying like they've said GPT four mm. and beyond. Pause the. You know, to to do as you say, to put in those guardrails and mm. and sort of make sure that it isn't getting out of hand. Because you know, all these little crazy scientists are all over the place doing God knows what, mm. and the risk that we face as a as humanity is that we're a global community now, and you only have to really look at the whole COVID nineteen situation and um, and how quickly that was able to spread across the world mm. because of how how hyper connected we all are not just physically, but also digitally and mentally. So again, it's like maybe in the past, all right, there's, there's some mad breakout or there's a techno, you know, there's a robot just going crazy. All right, cool. We can lock them off, you know, within that village or whatever. Whereas now the robot runs crazy on a global scale Mm -hmm. before anyone has any chance to react to it. But how if we had COVID today, if we were if we went back X number of years and we had the power of AI now, would we have handled that COVID situation differently today than we did for however long it was, three or four years ago? Pot- I bet we would. It Potentially. Would have, thousands of lives would have been saved. Yeah, but I but I throw back to you. Could the AI have made decisions 
that, you know, everyone talks about how the government's mishandled it and whatever, whatever. Mm. Well, what if the AI was much more ruthless in its approach and was like, well, actually, if you do the calculations, if we allow 3 million people to die, mm. it'll all be gone much quicker and then we could ju- and, and it'll be eradicated or whatever. Mm. And as humanity, most people are, are not going to go, yeah, yeah, just <laughs> yeah. spin them <laughs> off. But I think that's where- Like we de- do in the poultry world. <laughs> but I think that's where decisions in business, are, sometimes people rely too heavily on data mm. for me. And it's, yeah, you need to use data, but you need to use your experience and your your instinct. And there's a whole host of variables that should flow into that decision making. I never thought I'd hear you say such a thing, Steve. Well, well, <laughs> and no, because I-, I I absolutely believe that, and that in that circumstance, mm. you know, a, a committee of the right people should have said, right, well, we've got a feed in from AI that suggests, based on modelling, yeah. this is the best course of action, and that we need to accept three million deaths. Well, is that the right thing to do? Because if let's model it a different way, if we don't do that, what's the consequence? Well, it, we look better because we're not perceived as being so heartless. But yeah. overall, six million people die. Is, is that still the right decision? Yeah, but and that, but that's that that's what makes us human, isn't it? And I don't want to get all like sort of twee about it, but like you know, it's it's kind of easy, isn't it, to say, well, you know, the the few are sacrificed for the benefit of the many, mm. but like, what if you're one of the what if you're in that few, but, that mm. so called few? Well, actually, so right, I'm going I'm going on this theme. Chat. GPT or an AI bot using the COVID analogy goes, do you know what? We, we've crunched some numbers, crunched some data. Actually, do you know what? If we let 3 million, bearing in mind to start with, the age demographic was the the elderly. They were the first ones that were potentially, if you said globally, right, 3 million of you older, and I'm, I'm going far out here, but 3 million of the older generation, yeah, to give the youngsters, your grandchildren, your great grandchildren, a chance to kick on sooner, and we we eradicate this. Do you know what? I'd probably go as far as to say I think people would go for the greater good, on the basis that we've been advised that that yeah. let let's do it. We faced this decision before, haven't we? At the end of the Second World War, it's like, do we yeah, yeah. drop an atom bomb on Japan and that. kill? Tell us about it, John. <laughs> uh, or you know, how long? How many deaths would there have been yeah. fighting it? Yeah, yeah, on land, you know, a lot more. Anyway, we've kind um, of diverged off. Yeah, I'm, but- I'm just going to take you back to the your comment about Elon and um, money, and you know, and him not being bothered. He's got loads of money. I don't think it's a money thing with him. You're right. He's got you know ridiculous amounts of money, as some of the mega tech you know mm. founders of companies have as well it's 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 legacy and it's about you know because he's got rockets he's got cars mm. whatever other things he's got you know mm. but he's been this is not a uh spur of moment thing from elon he's he's got history hasn't he? yeah, he's got a track record of saying time. we need whereas, to be very whereas very Steve careful Wozniak has been quite dismissive of ai actually in the past right um and has and has said which i think is true to a degree that artificial intelligence is not actually intelligent and it won't be for a long time and what we mm. call ai is not ai in in this in you know as we would see it in the movies for example mm. so I, I suppose if <clears throat> if we reflect back on the open letter but for me maybe one of the biggest disappointments is it's all right to say uh, you know pause so as you touched on a bit earlier we've got all these unbelievably bright people that are developing this at a massive rate on a daily basis, yes, just stop what you're doing. Mm. Well, their brains aren't going to allow them to stop what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, facts. What I would have preferred to have seen was what we want to call a, you know, a global convention. We want to do something. We want to bring all the minds together and go, what can we do? Here's some, here's 10 points that we want to discuss mm. as to how we can make it safe with these guardrails that we can then carry on. Instead, it's let's pause and no one's going to pause, are they? Because mm. there's no. no authority behind an open letter. Uh, maybe, because maybe. again, to 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 liken it to COVID and everything, it's like we saw drastic things put in place that you know, at least in our generation, we'd never experienced like stuff like that. You know, just literally being told, "Don't leave your house." Like you, you're not allowed to leave your house. Basically, mm. that's that's what they were essentially saying. And that was done because things were things could have spiraled so insanely out of control that a very drastic, almost draconian thing had to be 
you know, put in place, which will then inform how we deal with situations like this in the future. And I think it's the same with this. It's like, if the governments really felt the need to do so, like COVID, they could just say, look, you are not to work on this stuff. No, yeah, are there going to be like some, you know, 4chan hackers in their bedroom in the dark still doing it? Sure, and they probably still are, mm. right? But to slow the whole thing down and just kind of put the brakes on it a little bit, I just think, you know, the letter's pretty ominous. Maybe mm. it's just, maybe they're just getting overexcited over nothing. But Bill Gates had been saying for years before the pandemic that like, something big's going to hit us any day now and we're not prepared for it and we need to be prepared. And then it hit us and everyone panicked. And I'll bet you the next time something like that happens, the response will be a lot more efficient than it was the first time around. And mm -hmm. people will take that a lot more seriously. And there's a lot more money going into those sectors basically to sort that sort of stuff out. Okay, me again, just jumping in to talk about one of the processes that we often get asked to automate, which is the processing of supplier invoices, also known as accounts payable automation. So what does that mean? Well, most businesses receive invoices from their suppliers and a lot of businesses still have people that are manually reviewing those invoices, making sure that they're correct, making sure they're accurate, and then manually rekeying them into a finance system or an, or an ERP system. Well, our solution can automate that process. So typically an invoice will come in, we'll use capture technology to understand what's on that invoice. We'll then match that data up against goods received note to make sure that we've received the product. We'll match it up against purchase order data to make sure that somebody has placed an order for that product. And ultimately, if we can match that up, we can automatically push that into an ERP system or finance system and nobody has to touch it. How good does that sound? If there are exceptions, if there are things that need to be checked, that's fine. We can use digital workflow to push that to somebody to eyeball it and say, is this correct or does something need to change? Ultimately, though, that can then be pushed again into an ERP system or a finance system. This is about making your life easier. It's about making operations as quick and as efficient as possible. And we do that all the time. If that sounds interesting, then get in touch. That's enough from me. Back to the podcast. Yeah, I guess the truth is we don't really know what's going on behind the closed doors of, of Google. You know, we've, we've seen ChatGPT 3, seen ChatGPT 4. I, I suspect, you know, the, the guys that are developing the code at the minute, they're months if not years ahead and, and you're right actually maybe, maybe you're convincing me maybe it's a chat but gp we, 20 well, it probably is in development in yeah and we we maybe they're seeing stuff in that running that, models and they're yeah. seeing what what potentially the future holds can i can i so i've got some notes here can i just please do right so well firstly there's a few interesting quotes that i've i thought um worth bringing up so um First quote is, many people seem to believe that superhuman machine intelligence would be very dangerous if it were developed, but think that is it is either never going to happen or definitely is far off. This is sloppy and dangerous thinking, Steve. And that was from a blog written by Sam Altman, who is the CEO of OpenAI. Um, and then we have Ilya Sutskever, who's who? arguably the brains behind OpenAI and GPT-4. And he said, I would not underestimate the ability to align future models with our own. Meaning, being able to properly control future versions that are much smarter than humans and have the ability to conceal their intentions. So now it's getting a bit Skynet-ish. Mm -hmm. And so then I saw the um, one of the reports that was cited within this open letter, um, which was from Bostrom. Um, and it was called X Risk Analysis for AI Research. And the bit that caught my eye and I think was quite like spooky dooky was this bit that said speculative hazards and failure modes. So there were eight, um, eight of these that they'd put, that they'd labeled out. So weaponization, enfeeblement, eroded epistemics, um, um, proxy gaming, value locking, Emergent goals, deception, and power-seeking behavior. So, obviously, weaponization and um, deception and power-seeking behavior are quite self-explanatory. Um, two of the ones that stood out to me was the... Um, well, so enfeeblement is basically... If you've seen Wally, -E, you know, the on the spaceship, the way all the humans are just so reliant on bots and they get all fat and whatever. Um, eroded epistemics so this is where humanity could have a reduction in rationality due to a deluge of misinformation or highly persuasive manipulative ai systems which is what we're sort of seeing 
the early signs of with these fake images and what have you. And then value locking, which is a state in which the values determining the long-term future of F originating life can no longer be altered. Wow. You convinced me, I think. Yeah. I mean, that you just might understand like, half of that. You just no. let that sail over your head. <laughs> the, the interesting thing on the, um, the you know, the, the sort of fake news, you know, pictures and things like that, you could even go as far and say current human mainstream media mm. is, is fake news because it's just, it's opinion and, 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 different people's agenda you watch mm. the bbc it's got one side and you look on the, the other channel and they're you know one's right wing one's left wing and then you go to channel four and it'll be something else yeah. and then you go to the sky you know uh, you know satellite or sky or whatever so i don't think in in that context i don't think it'll be any different well, it's the weaponization for me well the weaponization is like its ability to um so they've already been able to work out more effective biochemical weaponry um, just by asking it to come up with ideas and um, its ability to outmaneuver, you know, like um, get missiles and planes and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and then as you say with this, the because it, it, it does become a bit of an existential threat in a sense because, you know, it's, it's almost like that matrix thing where how do you actually know anything reality is even true you know again and it, an old elon sort of trope is like we're living in a simulation mm. the odds of us being in a simulation are higher than the odds that we're not in a simulation and like you know i'm going to jump about here a little bit but like say like north korea which is famously famous north korea is the bad one in it yeah the, yeah yeah <laughs> it's so f famous for mis misrepresenting itself to the citizens that live there yeah. right who don't know a lot of stuff that's going on outside of the country and are taught stuff about their leaders and stuff like that that is not true um and so imagine that on a global scale potentially because you could be seeing stuff we could all be seeing stuff that is not true and we've got no way to verify it if we're all seeing it you know it's like the whole did russia influence elections and it's been proven that they have meddled in stuff like that. Mm. So suddenly you get to a point where it's like, it's very difficult to discern what's true and what's not true. Now we're all making decisions that are risky, mm. not just on a government level, but like the three of us could make terrible decisions on, you know, what we're eating or drinking or where we're driving or the city that we live in or whatever. So I just, you know. I suppose when so, you compare it to nuclear, actually, yeah, nuclear as a... Or the atom bomb, as you, as I keep going back to, and you mentioned earlier, but we have got to the epitome of destruction, I guess, with mm. the atom bomb, and we've, we've, as a, as a globe, as a world, we've put some restrictions around that and restricted who can access it. And I guess, yeah, you're right. AI is probably the, the atom bomb of the information age, and we need to think about how do we, mm. how do we start to control that in the same way that we have done. I am become deaf. There you go. The famous, the, the film's coming out soon as well, um, on a slightly more <laughs> upbeat note. Um, Christopher Nolan, are you, have you seen the trailer? No. Oppenheimer, it's called. Right. It's all about, um, you know, the man himself who created the, obviously created the first atom bomb, famously said, you know, I'm become deaf, the destroyer of worlds. And, um, went on to have quite a fall from grace after the fact and was sort of pushed out of government and was 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 sort of um, smeared as like a communist and all this other stuff, potentially in, a, in an effort to silence him because he ha had massive regret at being involved at creating, you know, such a terrible mm. uh, weapon. Yeah, exactly. Mm. <clears throat> and I, I suppose that's the thing for me. It's like, there's, there's a couple of things to this. Well, more than a couple, but... How quickly can we get some sort of order? Mm. Uh, then how's it going to be managed? Let's say we don't get any order. The open letter gets ignored. <clears throat> and I'm being Dr. Gloom here, but just usual. But how quickly could this escalate to being a problem? Because, mm. I mean, it was only months ago, chat GPT-3, and now we're already at chat GPT-4, mm. and like we were saying earlier. And then for... <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like I'm naturally going on the dark side and worrying about weaponization and, and stuff like that. But it's like, 
you know, just the thought that actually a bot or a, com a, a computer run by a bot could then control air traffic control, global yeah. air traffic control, yeah. and just planes start dropping out of the sky. Yeah, you, know, you look at Russia have got these hypersonic, you know, nuke bombs or whatever they are. Well, they're going to be nothing compared to just the fact that someone in their back bedroom in <laughs> with whatever. But it's um, yeah, that's the, me the, looking on the dark side. The power and the the people that are truly developing this is the big. It's Microsoft, it's Google. IBM. It'd be relatively sort of easy for you know the, for Biden or whoever to get those people in a room and start to put some structure around this and and lean on those organisations to say, well, you need to help us. You know, we'll support you in terms of developing the technology, but you need to help us in terms of how we can start to control and put guardrails around that control that technology. And yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that's happening. It might be, but if it isn't, then it needs to happen very quickly. That's where I do agree with Elon. Does the government pose a risk there here as well? Because, like, you could argue that, like the atom bomb, whoever's the first to develop such technology, you know, basically kind of can sort of, like, control the world, really, mm. or becomes, you know, America already the, the superpower of the world. Some would say China is quickly catching them up. There's talk of India being able to get to that point as well. Mm. Um, you know, could it actually be a case of, right, well, actually, we, we want you in the room. Again, it's the post-war, let's get all of these, you know, Nazi scientists in basically, mm, yeah, naturalize them in our country. And then they basically develop a bunch of this stuff. I'm pretty sure us even, well, I say us, America landed on the moon, was helped along by the former Nazis. Nazis that developed the V2 rocket. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, no, well, you're, you're right, an but then... By, you're an optimist by nature. I am, and I yeah, like yeah. that about you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, a, it's we're living in a global world, aren't we? So if America are probably at the cutting edge of this, but I suspect China are not very far behind. Mm. And I don't think the US will be in a position where they can control the world more than they do because of AI. Because I just think everybody's making that same investment along the same journey at the minute could be so what where do we go for as as you, you, you've digital? sort of convinced me i'm i am the ever the optimist and um, i'm a bit relaxed maybe about this sort of stuff but yeah i think this six month window to maybe just step back a little bit from the breach and think what do we need to do as a civilization to put some controls around this and work out how we're going to harness the the undoubted benefits that it brings mm -hmm. but also make sure that we don't drive ourselves off a cliff at the same time yeah i think there's there's definitely some benefit in that do you think it'll happen no because i just think the government's got other all the majority of other governments got too many other priorities at the minute the, the economy and everything else that it's just not high enough on their priority list to start to engage with google and microsoft and start to focus a lot of time and resource on how do we use AI for good and control the bad? So we're doomed. So, so we could could we not have a United Nations tech hub? We could. That that could uh, you know um, look to bring all the the mega minds together. Get Biden on the phone like then, and and let's start to facilitate it. He might be having his afternoon nap though. He probably he? is. Yeah, in fairness, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably a good spot to to end it. Leave it there. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Um, and this podcast was generated by AI. This was, it was a voice, a language model and a voice model and a deep fake model. How do you even know that any of this is real? How did it know, John? Prove it. Your top. It's a good top, mate. I thought that would make me better looking. You're a handsome devil. You, he struts around the office thinking he's like some male model. And then he gives it, thought they'd make me look better. Oh my God.